Hello! Welcome to the Daily Decrypt, episode 12. I am Amanda, your host. Today, Bitcoin is $267, Dash is $2.38, BitShares is 40% of a cent, and Monero is 38 cents. I saw a headline today, Crypto Thrift rebrands as Bitify, and I thought to myself, I don't really know what, what is crypto thrift to begin with. And now that it's changed to Bitify, what what was it? What is it? And it turns out it's it's like the eBay for people who want to buy and sell in Bitcoin. I had no idea. I remember hearing the term crypto thrift, but I had no idea. So it's been functioning for two years. Uh, apparently 50,000 people have registered to buy and or sell there. And Bitify... <laughs> now Bitify. Uh, Bitify has acted as the escrow for this, for these people, and has processed 2.5 million worth of Bitcoin in trade so far. And if you decide to sell things through Bitify and are happen to be shipping from the US, why not ship using Shipcoin? Uh, Shipcoin.co will print out your USPS postal labels for you. You give them the deets of where your package needs to go, you send them the bitcoins, and then they send you a printable USPS label. You can get all of your shipping done online with bitcoin. In computer security news, I saw a tweet today, I wish I could remember who it was from, I don't, on a white paper called On the Insecurity of a Self-Encrypting Drive Series. The abstract says, in this paper, we will look into the Western Digital My Passport series, which is a very popular hard drive. They say, we will describe the security model of these devices and show several weaknesses like RAM leakage, weak key attacks, and even back doors on some of these devices, resulting in decrypted user data without the knowledge of any user credentials you have Western Digital hard drives, this might be a white paper you would like to check out. An organization called Let's Encrypt would like to make securing your website as an HTTPS website much easier than it has been in the past. Apparently getting a security certificate from Let's Encrypt will not involve, as it usually does, validation emails, complicated configuration editing, or expired certificates. Apparently it can actually all be done from your command line. Not only that, but the software is all open source and free to use. So that seems like it could be kind of neat. Set to arrive within a few months. And on to health news. This is neat, very neat. Two years ago in India, a man 32 year old man broke his hip and he was told that he would never walk again and for the past two years he did not walk but then he visited a hospital called the sims hospital or the sims and the doctors there decided to 3d print a life-size model of this man's body and then practice on it so that they could develop a surgery that would repair his hip and 3dprint.com happily reports that the surgery was successful and this man, Pradeep, who was told he would never walk again, is now walking for the first time in two years. The doctors at Sims Hospital have since used this procedure on two more patients. In virtual reality news, Gizmodo reports that the New York Times is sending subscribers in the mail something called Google Cardboard and this will allow people to put their smartphones within this piece of cardboard, strap the thing to their head and experience some kind of form of virtual reality. And this is all timed to coincide with the New York Times release of their own virtual reality app and a virtual reality film they've made called The Displaced, which is about children uprooted by war. Pretty cool. Not the war part. And in transportation news, Wired has reviewed three hoverboards. 
And I can't believe I'm actually saying that, like it's a real thing, but yes, the hoverboards are apparently a thing, and here's what Wired has to say. So firstly, there's the Omni hoverboard, and it uses propellers, similar to a quadcopter or a hovercraft, to give it lift. And it's battery powered, so its major drawback is that the flight time is only going to be about a minute or so. Secondly is the Hendo hoverboard, and it uses magnetic levitation, like trains in Japan. And so this requires that the board be over a surface that is conducive to receiving electromagnetic charges, and so its drawback is that the surfaces that it can hover upon are somewhat limited. And lastly, the Lexus hoverboard also uses an electromagnetic field to gain its lift, but it employs supercooled semiconductors near its magnets, and the drawback of these being that they need to have a steady supply of liquid nitrogen in order to work. So all in all, the first generation of working hoverboards actually are here. They're probably not mass marketable yet as they don't work in many instances or will just require something odd like a negative 320 degree little container of liquid nitrogen in your pocket. But imagine what the second generation might look like. And that has been your Daily Decrypt. I bet you know someone who gets just as excited as you, or more, about new tech and innovations. Do them a favor and pass this series along.